Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to a, uh, another special edition of the show with some special guests we have with us here today in the Zoom, Joe DiBiase and Sean Drover. You've heard these names before, Fate's Warning, Megadeth, Act of Defiance. They've got a new project uh, that's brand new. Album just came out two days ago. The, al the album is called Prophets of Demise. The band is called Withering Scorn on Frontier Records. Welcome, Joe and Sean. Been following both of you guys forever, so happy to have you here on the show. What's happening? Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Yep, thanks for having us on. I'm a big fan of, uh, the, of the channel myself, so it's a pleasure thanks to be here. I appreciate that, that Joe. I, I, I remember, God, it seems like it's yesterday, but it was probably 30-something years ago seeing you with Fate's Warning in a little club in Poughkeepsie, New York, called The Chance way back when. Um, man, how the time has flied. And uh, and Sean, you as well, saw you with Megadeth numerous times. And uh, But, you know, that's that's kind of all in the past. The present is withering scorn. So can you guys talk about the, the genesis of the band, how this came about? And this kind of very quietly, all of a sudden, boom, here's the album, here's the band. So uh, kind of how did it all start? Well, I mean, really, it started with the pandemic, you know, once that hit and we all came to the realization that there's no touring in any capacity, people, you know, no one was going to work or anything. Yeah. And really, you know, uh, I had acted defiance had just kind of gone their separate ways because ways Chris joined in flames, which is, you know, Chris Roderick joined in flames, which was very, I was very happy, you know, for him with all that. And Glenn hit me up, he said, look, you know, Glenn has uh, Glenn's had a recording studio now for almost 30 years now. And he said, look, man, we're, we're not doing anything. Why don't we just start writing some songs and just kind of have some fun with it? So I said, you know, yeah, it's a good timing. And, and uh, so Glenn hit up Joe and Joe was into it. And so the three of us just started kind of, you know, uh, writing music kind of, again, with the pandemic, you know, we weren't in the studio all together doing it, you know, cranking it out in a week, you know, Van Halen style, but, uh, so over the course of time, we started, you know, getting some songs together and stuff. And um, we also asked the singer, uh, Henning Bossy, who's over in, uh, over in Germany, about, you know, I was a big fan of his for a long time and he was into it. So really over the course of the last three years, we got this record together. And uh, in March of this year, we finished it. And, um, you know, then we started shopping it and, and really lucky for us it, it didn't take long i think i think it took less than two weeks maybe 10 days maybe a little more than 10 days and frontiers um was very interested and uh they loved the record so they offered us a deal literally the next day and um I, I've, I've been super impressed with how they've been uh handling their business and and uh they've been very straightforward uh company and uh you know and really, here we are. Uh, the record just came out Friday, July 7th, and uh, we're real excited about it. Yeah, I mean, Frontiers, this is what they do, right? I mean, they specialize in heritage bands, you know, who have been around a while and are looking for a new label. And as well as these kind of like supergroup things where, you know, you've got these all-star collaborations. And that's we've seen a lot of that on their on their label, in most, especially in most recent years, and especially since the pandemic, right? I mean, everything you, you just said, I've heard from so many other musicians over the last couple of years who, you know, kind of like, well, we got to do something, right? So let's, let's just put a, let's put a band together. Let's do a, put a project together. Let's record an album. We can't do it in the same place, but with technology, we can make it happen. So, uh, and, and, and I failed to, to mention this at the top of the hour. So of course we got Joe on bass, Sean on drums, your brother Glenn on guitar, and Henning Bossi on uh, vocals, of course, from Metallium and previously with Firewind. So was he like the first choice for this? Was this like, did you were you searching for singers or did was he like, that's the guy we want right off the bat? I, th I think we hit up Henning first. Um, Glenn had worked with him. Glenn did a record, um, a solo record, which is called uh, Walls of Blood, which, you know, Joe, I think I think Joe played on a couple of tracks. Is that right, Joe? Did you play a song or two on that record? Yeah, I mean that's how I really got to know Glenn. Glenn hit me up uh, via email out of the blue, really, because I know of Glenn. I didn't really know him, and he said, "Hey, I'm doing a solo album. You want to play a track on it?" I said, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I, had, I had just really started playing full time again at the time, so I was, figured it's a great opportunity. It worked out so well. I ended up doing a, a second song on that record, Walls of Blood, which is a great record if nobody's ever heard it. Um, and yeah, Henning was on a song on that as well. So we had, uh, 
that's how we, me and Glenn and Henning, basically how we knew each other. So kind of right. So I, you know, sorry, and and I I collaborated with Glenn um, on several songs on that record uh, on that record as well. I can't remember off the top of my head which ones I helped him on. Um, some he did on his own, and some I, I collaborated with him. So really, if you think about it, kind of the four of us got together in 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 some weird way on on that record, and that's really probably how. Uh, to answer your question about Henning, you know, we already worked, you know, Glenn already worked with him and, you know, he does a great job. He's, we think he's a great singer. He's set up in a, another important part too, is are, are you set up at home with Pro Tools and, and recording gear to actually do it? And of course, Joe is and Henning is as well. So we all are. So really, it was pretty simple, you know, again, uh, Glenn had worked with Joe and Henning on his record that he did. So it was kind of a no brainer, you know, we We've loved Joe for years, you know, obviously with Fate's Warning, we always thought he was a, a stellar bass player and he still is. So, uh, you know, we're just glad. We're just really hitting up, you know, you know, people that we respect and now we've become friends and stuff. And, you know, we all kind of share the same vision. You know, Joe's right on the same page as, as Glenn and I. And uh, that's a real important part of it as well is, is having people who have kind of the same musical vision and not spatting about this and all stupid stuff. As, you know what I mean? So. Joe's right in line with us in terms of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to express ourselves. So that's, that's a lot of fun for us to have a, another guy on our team, you know? Cool. And Joe gets major props today for wearing that, that kick-ass Witchfinder General shirt, which you don't see out in the wild anywhere, right? How cool is that? <laughs> a huge fan of the band, yeah. Oh, yeah, we all are, right? It's like, yeah. oof, good stuff. So like I said, I had the pleasure of listening to Prophets of Desire. and I think initially I was surprised at just how damn heavy it is. And what I what I liked about it is that you don't necessarily hear any elements. I shouldn't say any, but not much of like the previous bands you guys have been with. You guys have all been with some really notable bands in the past. Did, did you guys like set out specifically to say, Lord, let's create something here that's not kind of thrash. It's not really prog metal, but just kind of classic kick-ass heavy metal because, I mean, that's where you all came from initially anyway. Was, was that something you you really wanted to come up with something unique sounding that didn't, didn't doesn't sound like Fate Warning, doesn't sound like Megadeth, so on and so forth? Was that like kind of like a uh, something you set about to do right off the bat? No, um, not at all. I mean, I've, I wrote most of this record um, as I've done with all all the idol on records we did in the past, you know, I wrote most of those songs. Um, Glenn and I have had an agreement for almost 30 years now. So, you know, Glenn does all, with his studio, does all the engineering. He mixes the record. He does so much work, you know, getting the tracks from Joe and Henning, my, my drum tracks and all this crazy work that he does, you know? And I said years ago, look, let me, you know, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I've been writing songs for years. I said, let me focus on the songwriting and that way we can kind of contribute equally. You know, of course he writes some stuff too. He, you know, on the, on the new record, he, uh, he's written parts in I think four of the songs if I'm, I'm not mistaken off the top of my head, but um, uh, you know, and to answer your question, I, I've been kind of writing the same. I don't cater to or really think about, oh, this is, let's write like this or let's not write like this because, you know, I just write how I write. I just write heavy metal songs and it's like, you know, Here's here's another batch, you know. Do, you know, does Joe and Glenn like them? And hey, you know, oh, they like it. Okay, well, if you know, it really comes from we have to like the music first. And uh, of course, I've submitted riffs or, or you know, that Glenn didn't like or what? No, I don't like this. It sounds too much like this, you know. So maybe in a roundabout way, if we if I write something or Glenn writes something, that, oh, that dude, that sounds too much like Priest or it sounds too much like Slayer or whatever, you know. We're mindful of that, but I don't really necessarily try to be original or try not to sound like anybody you're always going to sound like a little bit like somebody because it's, it's nothing's really that original anymore for the most part you know yeah. but and this is a long-winded answer to your question but yeah i didn't really try to not sound like anything or so it just sound came like naturally it. And, and yeah and, it was very and, organic you know do you guys you know does joe and glenn like it yes they like it it's awesome okay let's let's work on that and, and assemble some some tracks and, and that's it's kind of always been like that for me yeah i mean there are some kind of jews priest moments here and there I, I guess that's kind of hard not to do these days right every band is influenced by that plays metal has been influenced by jews priest like specifically the vision and pick up the pieces 
which are complete bangers, right? And I hear a little Priest vibe there, maybe a little bit on the vocals. And, you know, I, it's more like kind of like uh, painkiller type stuff. It's the intensity of that. Um, I got to say, and from the first listen, I was like, I love the production of this album. I mean, the guitars are super crunchy, which is what you want. And Sean, man, your drums are like nice and high in the mix right alongside the drums everything you hear everything perfectly crystal clear in the mix but it's potent and powerful and full of energy i mean you know how meticulous how long was were you guys working on the production of this album because it sounds like something that a lot of care was given to and it really really kicks ass it's very very pleasing to the ears if you're a metal fan this is exactly what you want you know this is a day and age we hear all these muddy productions and you know it's uh you can tell things were done quickly i can tell that there was a lot of work done on this and, and it really sounds really really good yeah glenn glenn's super meticulous almost to the point of nauseam sometimes it's like dude you know he'll send me and joe 19 mixes of you know what do you think of the you know, keep sending revisions which is, look it's a great thing you know to, to care that much um he's very meticulous about everything um all you know his guitar tracks you know if if, if i do something in a, in a tune that he thinks i can do better then joe will attest to this too it's like you know you know he'll say come on you know you you know, you can do better. I think you can do better than this, you know, or try to do a little more of this and that. He's not afraid to see, he kind of acts as, as the producer in that sense. And, and that's a good thing. You know, it may, it could irritate you for a second, but look, it, you know, making great music to me, it should never be that easy. You know, it, it you know, we all care that much. And, uh, but Glenn has no problem telling Joe or Henning or myself and, and himself, you know, that to say, you know, you know, you kind of need to fix that part. You know, Joe, tell I mean, you'll, you know, Joe will tell you as well. Yeah, I mean, and as far as taking our time, well, this album from beginning to end took us almost three years to complete. You know, from the time Glenn contacted me to say, hey, let's start, let's start this band with my brother. And I mean, we all have other things going on in our lives and there really was no rush as, you know, we didn't have a label. We were just doing this for fun, you know. Let's write some songs together. It literally took three years from beginning to end. So um, we had time to take our time, you know, uh, and get everything right. Um, so that, that, that's why. Uh, and as Sean said, Glenn is very meticulous, you know. I'll, do, I'll send him a track, which I thought, man, whew, that was the best track I've done. This is, this is a piece of cake. You know, I send it off and the next day I get an email. So, dude, you, you can do better than this. You know, this this one part here, you're hitting uh, these three notes. It sounds like crap. I mean, you know, I didn't, I certainly don't take offense to it. You know, I've been around and I know how producers are and stuff as, as far as that. Um, he's, he is meticulous, like Sean said. So uh, we did it right, for sure. <laughs> Part of it too, and I, I've talked a lot about this over the years, that there's something to be said when you're creating an album about track sequencing, right? And one of the things I like so much about this record, first of all, that you guys bust out of the gate with the title track, which is just like an absolute killer song. And, you know, you have to, in this day and age, you know, people's attention span aren't what it used to be. So if someone's going to buy an album, you got to grab them by the throat right off the bat. And I think that one totally does. I mean, the riffs are tremendous. The rhythms are great. His vocals are tremendous. Um, and then, you know, Glenn drops in these blistering solos, but the solo sections are not overly long, right? They're to the point. Uh, was that like, yeah, and again, maybe it, that would be a question for him, but I noticed throughout the album, it's like you have a couple bangers in a row, then there's the more epic atmospheric piece, then you got a couple more bangers, and then you get the big epic at the end of the album. It's just the sequencing is just so good. Uh, did, was there a lot of discussion about the order of the tracks and how you kind of put them all in line? Because I think a, a, a lot of bands don't take too much stock in that anymore. I think there's an art to putting an album together and being able to perfectly place everything for maximum effect for the listener. But me and uh, we're old school. I mean, me and Sean actually put the, the order together. Actually, I came up with the initial order. I think it made a change one or two songs, but we we're old school and we listened to albums back in the day, you know, LPs, side one, side two, yep. and that's how we thought of it. So I really put a lot of thought and and Sean put a lot of thought into the order, just like you said, a couple of bangers to kick out, 
you know, and maybe a slower pace thing. And so, yeah, we did think a lot about that. And we also thought a lot about the length of the album. Because like you said, me included, we don't have the attention span we used to have. We don't, I can't absorb an hour and 10 minute long record anymore. You know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult to stay in age. So we purposely wrote a 40, 45 minute album. We didn't want anything longer. It's not like we have five songs we left out. I mean, we had what we had, but we didn't feel any need to make it an hour, you know? How, who has time to sit down and listen to an album, you know, an hour long album and absorb it and go back and listen again? We, we feel that, man, you, you put this album on, it's 40 minutes long and you want to go hear it again, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's how I lo- like to listen to albums. That's how Sean likes to listen to albums. So that was all um, done on on purpose yes okay yeah it makes sense because you got like like ancient desire for me is kind of like the first kind of like mid-paced a little more atmospheric piece and that's like right in the middle it's like perfectly placed and then you got all the way at the end i'm trying to think uh, eternal screams is the big long track at the end i mean long it's not that long but it's longer uh and i think it both of those work really well you know it's like let's kick your ass for a couple tracks and then take a little bit of a breather something a little different and then kick your ass again for a couple songs and then we'll finish it out big epic heavy doomy atmospheric fashion that's the album right there like you said 45 minutes done works really well yeah, I mean, look, you know, Joe nailed it. You know, everything, everything with this record and in, in every aspect is by design. You know, we, you know, Joe and I took care of the, the song sequencing, and, and like Joe said, we just referenced the vinyl, right? So here's the first four songs. Here's the, you know, here's side B. So you know, you get like you said, you gotta gotta come out, punch him in the face with the first song. You flip it over to side B. You gotta do the same, you know, because you know our we know that you, you can lose the listener real quick these days, right? They don't, they don't have the attention span. Like we all suggest, like, you know, when we bought records about as look at your CD collection, you have 5 million CDs the back of you, you know, you take, you take stock and in, in you bought all that stuff. So you take stock in that it, it, for the money you, and you go home and, it, and it's an experience, right? You listen to it, but you know, again, this is CDs. So it's a little bit different, but you know, I'm sure you have a bunch of vinyl too. So, you know, it all is important. The, the sequencing of the record we find is extremely important because once you lose the listener, that you know, it's pretty much it. Like, why would you, you know? But you got to get it's like a roller coaster ride, right? You come, you know, you come and screaming down with a you know a fast track or whatever, and then you kind of, you know, there's a lot of dynamics with this record, and we're we're real happy with that. Instead of having all the same kind of songs or whatever, which, which is fine with a lot of bands, but. We, you know, we knew we had a lot of different types of tunes in this record, so it was real important to for us to sequence the record to what we thought was the best uh, order. Yeah, it works. It works. And and you're right. There's a lot of different feels on this record. Like uh, another thing that I noted down here, one of my favorite songs is "Dark Reflection," which is I think the one point on the album. You know, I said at the beginning how you, it seems like you guys tried not to really sound a lot like some of the other bands you've you've had in the past but there's a little merciful fake king diamond thing going on in that song i mean i think like the guitar solos has like that kind of like teutonic vibe right which we got like like that michael dinner michael shanker thing going on there and then Henning's vocals has this kind of like it's got this king thing going on there can you talk a little bit about that one that's a really really cool track well that's i mean you know glenn was in king diamond so there's there's yeah. th- you can't help and we're you can't all get that out of your system i'm sure right? you can't we're all massive fans you know um yeah it wasn't again it wasn't done by design i mean i i can hear what you're saying and and i don't disagree with it um yeah i mean you know we're that that was a huge huge influence on on glenn and i way before he he was even in the band you know imagine how excited i was when he got that gig you know that was that was a great time for us you know and uh sure i mean you know we're again, we're huge Merciful Fate fans, huge King Diamond fans, you know. You know, we had we had them play. We we actually idol on the last record we did, we did um a Merciful Fate track. We did the oath, and we Michael Denner and Hank Sherman did solos on on our version. So, you know, some of that is is gonna rub off maybe a little bit, but again, it wasn't by design. But if you're hearing that, I'm I'm gonna take it as a compliment. So yeah. It's not the first time I've heard the King Diamond uh sure comparison either and it's funny uh pete going back to uh for face warning for a second on the specter within if you listen to that record 
you're going to hear lots of uh, Merciful Fate influence on that record too, because back even way back then, we were deeply immersed in Merciful Fate. Well, I mean, Joe, that was an interesting time, right? Because that was uh, kind of a turning point for a lot of metal bands who were wanting to do something a little bit different. And I think, you know, Merciful Fate weren't, and, and you know, I've read interviews with the guys and they've talked about it. They weren't afraid to allow some of their kind of like prog rock early influences kind of creep into their form of metal and it's like so you, and you know with fate's warning as well it's, it's darker it's kind of doomy it's technical in spots you have this you know element of these virtuoso guitar solos and these otherworldly vocals you know um and you know like you look at fate's warning i mean look at those two singers you guys had in the band i mean just amazing amazing singers so it's kind of a cool time for metal to be kind of branching out into like different areas and i think you know fate's warning and merciful fate and king diamond and there's certainly other ones we could talk about we're, we're doing some you know era parents and there's all these bands that were around at that time that were trying to do something add a little kind of whether you want to call it progressive elements or not or doom or whatever um cool time to be and and i guess you can say more than any of us uh, what a cool time to be playing in a semi-successful band and seeing all these other bands around you doing some cool things as well yeah uh, that was a really interesting time in metal and we were we, we were very young at the time and we were just you know metal heads ourselves but we we all had um a love for uh Prague as well you know um so we we're genesis and death Roll toll fans um, so that some of that kind of uh, leaked in to our to our songs as well. So it was a real interesting mix back then, for sure. Oh yeah, we used to call it uh, back in the day. We used to call it like thinking man's metal because there, yeah. there was no such thing as progressive metal back in the mid '80s. Nobody was saying that at all. Right. And uh, I, I just remember the first time I heard guys like John Arch and King Diamond, and you know, being a Halford fan, right? You already and Jeff Tate, right? You already knew there were guys out there that could sing like that. But then all of a sudden these dudes come out and, and the music they're playing is completely different. You're like, Holy crap. You know, what is this? Right. It's yeah. a good time to be a metal fan. Back then. It was. Yep. Yeah. We were heavily influenced by, by, like I said, a lot of those prog bands, and, but we were also into merciful fate. We were heavily into loudness, look at loudness's early albums. Um, you know, <laughs> pick, pick to a lot of us. Oh, we, we were the kids that went down to the, the local store every Saturday and got the import magazines and the newest import records. I mean, that we were metal fans. We were just fans like anybody else. So we took influences from, from everywhere. Yeah. 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 I just want, I wanted to comment on a couple of the tracks here on the album. Uh, the Throne is just absolutely killer. I mean, that just completely crushes it. And, and again, it goes back to the sequencing thing. You know, I've noticed a lot of time, a lot of more recent releases. By the time you get to that back end of the album, you know, Joe, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, most of us 70 minute long albums were just like, man, we just don't have the, the patience for it anymore. But man, I'm getting to the back end of your album. I'm like, it just, it just keeps getting heavier and better. Right. So the throne hit me and I was like, holy cow, this is like, you know, I'm trying to think when was the last time we're like at track eight, you know, out of a 10 song album, I forget exactly how many there are here, but I was like, this, it's just, just as good as when it first started. So, you know, there's a lot of really strong, strong uh, songs on this album, which I think is really cool. I think people are going to be really surprised and it's, it's just a great metal album. And yeah. one of the things that I wanted to, to bring up just because it happens uh you know i talked earlier about frontiers are really good with bringing to the market these kind of like super group bands right uh sometimes that can be a little much because there's so many of them and, and people's expectations are all right it's a studio project we'll see this one album and we'll never hear from them again so i guess my question is what is the future of this band? Is this going to be a band? Are you at any point in time considering maybe live stuff or is there uh, the possibility of another album down the road? So kind of like what's, what does the future hold for Withering Scorn now that the brand new album is out and we probably shouldn't even be talking about it yet, but I guess you kind of have to at some point, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, now this, this is not a, a one record thing uh, you know, what we wanted to, one of the cool thing about Frontiers is that that's one of the questions they asked me. They said, you know, are you, is because, you know, they want to work with their artists long-term. They just don't want to do a one and done. I said, well, that we're exactly in the same path because we're just, we're just getting started here. You know, we're, I'm already getting ideas for the next record. I mean, because, you know, now, now with signing a multi-record deal, you know, you have to be, 
it's there's a timeline now whereas you know like joe said it took us three years on and off to work on the first record because we didn't have a label now we have a label it's like okay now you got to get this record out at a certain time so i've already started the process for the next record for several reasons one of them is just i just i love creating music and i that's exciting for me still we're all still i'm speaking for joe here as well you know we we're all still excited to create new music that's what drives us really um to create new music and, and get together and do that that's that's a beautiful thing if you ask me you know not everybody gets to do that so we're we don't take it lightly so you know yeah this is this is just a, what you're hearing now is just the beginning we're we're going we're going to start working on a, the next record as soon as you know we assemble the first song we're just going to kind of you know here's a song you know guys glenn will do guitars joe will do bass we'll send it out to, you know have vocals on it and you know i like to be prepared way in advance you know especially now that i know there is a timeline i won't wait till the last minute it's like you know i have time i'll, I'll get inspired go up in my music room and start assembling some riffs and glenn will do the same you know i want joe to uh, to collaborate on this one you know as well with some ideas he has which that's exciting for me you know maybe me and joe can i mean my last can pretty much talking to joe right now it's like you know if we can co collaborate on some riffs together I, I think that'd be a great thing because i can hear something from joe or glenn and i can get inspired by that and you know i'm good at assembling riffs that's one of my strong points with, with formulating songs is I can take an idea from Joe or an idea from Glenn and kind of put that together and maybe put something that I have as well. And that's the way, you know, where we're stationed in the planet right now. It's a beautiful thing that we're able to do that, you know, in a, in a long distance way. So yeah, again, you know, we're, we're just getting started here. We're, we're going to work on the next record and, and we're contracted to do so. Cool. And I think, I think there's something you said about striking when the iron is hot, right? And for you guys, you are all names, right? I mean, this is, you're not <laughs> Jones at all. So I think there's going to be some excitement uh, around this album. And, you know, back to my earlier question about, you know, live stuff, right? I mean, it's, it, especially here in the States, it's tough for a band like yourselves to go out there and, you know, you're not going to be playing thousand two thousand seat venues right off the bat right so like would it you know is something like you know an opening slot on a saxon tour right even if it's playing you know five hundred thousand seat clubs i mean that's that's a start right because you're in front of an audience that probably is ready made for what you guys are doing it, it's an interesting time uh for touring right now because as yeah. you're seeing there's a lot of bands that are canceling tours yeah. a lot of bands aren't aren't even touring because the expenses have yep. really skyrocketed. Yep. Um, it's crazy. I mean, the cost of a tour bus alone, you know, bands are paying $20,000 a week, you know, between the bus rental, the driver, the fuel. I mean, it's really tough out there. In Europe, from what I understand, it's even worse. Um, so that's kind of a tough question. Um, we don't vision ourselves going on a three-month tour right no. now. Um and I, I think a lot of it's going to be based on how good the album does. I mean, right now, the interest seems pretty heavy. The reviews have all been really good. But, you know, how many people are actually going to buy it? How much demand will there be? Um, we kind of talked on the side. We haven't really had any deep discussions about touring. But I think what we can all envision is maybe some European festivals. I was just going to say, like, if Walken yeah. comes calling, they're like, hey, we want you guys to come play the new album, play some covers of stuff that you guys done, did previously. You know why yeah. not, right i mean that's right that's that's, that's what we're thinking more, more along those lines i mean like yeah. i say if demand dictates that people that many people want to see us and we have to do a, a tour i mean that's a great problem to have i guess we'll worry about that when the time comes but like i said i, I think we can envision doing some one-offs you know some shows in europe some you know there's a lot of festivals in the u.s nowadays too you know rock home and those types of things yeah so yeah. Um, that's what we're looking at right now because it's tough joe hennings in germany sean uh Glenn is in Canada, you know, I'm in Connecticut, Sean's down in Atlanta, we're all over the place. It's not like we can just uh, go over on the weekend and just see and let's, uh, let's rehearse a set, you know, it's, it's not that easy. Semantics are kind of tough. Yeah. yeah. Again, but, COVID, COVID's really the catalyst for all this too. I mean, it's just decimated the music industry in so many ways. And now, I mean, I, I think I saw yesterday, the day before, Sanctuary just can't, they were going to do an anniversary tour. You know, and over in Europe, they, they had to cancel it. You know, no one wants to cancel a tour, but it's all down to finance. That's, that's what it is. No one wants to go over there 
pay for all the all the airline just right off the bat just flying over there if you got a crew flying over there getting hotels you're at a financial deficit before you even right off the bat. press go so it's like a lot of these bands are, are canceling because even anthrax canceled earlier it's like it's all it all it's not really you know again you know Joe hit it on the head. You know, if Vakken call, comes calling next year, maybe some German festivals, or you know, if we can string together maybe ten days, two weeks of some festivals here and there, maybe a couple of club dates in between that. If there's a, uh, uh, if people are calling for that, we would consider it. But just to go over there and go on tour for five weeks, we would financially lose our ass. You know that it's not a secret. You know, so that's that's where we're at. Really, it's kind of, we're kind of in a in a wait and see position you know if, if there's a demand for it we will definitely consider it but we're not seeking it because we know what what you know what the, what it's like out there you know we hear it from our, our peers and you read it on the internet so you know it's it's a real drag man you know and everybody in their grandma you know from having being off tour for three years with covid now every band and their grandmother's on tour right now so it's like you know am i going to see arch enemy am i going to see testament Am I going to see who am I going to see this week? They can't afford to go see. <laughs> it's such such a wacky time. So yeah, I mean that, that has happened to me numerous times over the last year and a half. Where I'm like, uh, I think it was October last October and April recently, where like literally there was ten shows I would have liked to go to. I can't go to all of them. I can't even go to half of them, right? And it's like, why? And I and we always we all talk to each other like, well, why is everybody touring and hitting the New York area all at the same time? It's like it's just the way it works, right? Because everybody's dying to get back on the road. And now as fans, and and I've gone to a bunch of shows over the last two years, and you know, the the, the not, I'm not talking about the big big bands. You know, Iron Maiden's still going to go. <clears throat> priests are still going to go pack 15,000 people in, a, in an arena but like i mean i went to see metal church last weekend yeah there's maybe 200 people there right before covid there probably would have been 500 people there or more so it's like i've noticed like some of the smaller gigs there's not as many people uh because a lot of people still aren't going out there yet you know you they want to but uh, you know and again everybody's out so it's like you only have x amount of money to go to x amount of shows and maybe you're still feeling leery about being around a couple hundred people, right? So it's 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 a, we're in a tough time here when it comes to live music. We really are, and I hope we get out of it. But time will tell. Yep. So anyway, the new album is "Prophets of Demise" by Withering Scorn. Guys, any last words on why people need to go seek out and listen to this record? Because it kicks ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, though, it's like you said in the beginning, it's an old school heavy metal record. Yeah. It's not thrash. It's not power metal. It's not any subgenre or name you want to put on it. If you like old school, kick ass, plain old heavy metal, you know, like we used to listen to when we were younger. Um, that's what we hope we've made. So if that's the stuff you like. We urge you to check it out. Yeah, I would agree with all that. So uh, go check it out. It's available anywhere you buy your music. Frontiers Records, Joe DiBiase, Glenn Drover, Sean Drover, and Henning Bassi. Killer four-piece lineup. Crunchy heavy metal. Great vocals, drums, guitars, bass, the whole nine yards. Memorable songs. Uh, I think you guys will like it. For those of you watching who are just heavy metal fans, this is the album you should check out. So I want to thank Sean and Joe for joining me here today. Uh, we've been talking about doing this for quite a while. And I think it just made perfect sense to do it today now that the album just just hit so uh it's fresh and it's available and uh i want to thank both of you guys for joining us and everybody watching visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on youtube all together all the damn time please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell to get alert of all of our content as it posts and please do hit the like button before you leave for sean drover and joe dibiase i am Pete paro enjoy the rest of your weekend everybody and go check out the new album from withering scorn take care bye-bye